Welcome everybody to the uh, latest of the Strategic Dairy Farm webinars. Uh, this one is uh, we're hosting for uh, Buscott Wick Farm, uh, courtesy of, uh, of uh, the Kinch Partnership and uh, uh, Phil Kinch is with us today, along with uh, Herd Manager uh, Shane McNamee and uh, Heaven Richards will be uh, presenting today on transition management for the autumn calving herds. So I'll just uh, touch on a bit of housekeeping if we can click on a slide, lovely. Ooh, let's, sorry, let's just go back to that uh, previous one if I can, Jamie. So I'll just go through the introduction and housekeeping. We'll touch on the uh, strategic dairy farms and I'll do a bit of an update on that. I'm Nick Parsons, uh, Head of Dairy Development. And then we'll have a bit of an update from Shane on uh, Buscott Wick and uh, what's been going on since, uh, well, through the uh, through nearly the whole of the uh, uh, whole of the uh, uh, spring and, and summer activity. And then uh, Heaven will come in and talk about the transition, and we'll do a bit of a roundup with regards to uh, uh, questions and and uh, what we've uh, what we've presented today. Thank you, Jamie. I'll just touch on the uh, housekeeping piece. So most of you, I hope, will have already been on a uh, go-to webinar before, but everybody uh, uh, as attendees are muted. Uh, please use the uh, drop-down questions box for uh, sharing any questions, and I encourage you all to, uh, uh, to pose those questions to heaven and to, uh, to ask about the farm if you want to uh, understand anything specific about the farm today. And uh, we will be recording the session, and uh, so uh, that's available through the HDB website and through YouTube, and also Dairy Pro Points. Uh, you've got the opportunity for your CPD and uh, to be able to collect the uh, Dairy Pro Points on this webinar. And if you put in that questions box, your name, postcode, and uh, details, then it will uh, will will get that through to the team uh, on a, a Dairy Pro. As you can see there, the picture just shows you how to click open the orange uh, arrow, and it will then show you one of the drop downs and the questions, and just type a brief question into there. Uh, I have a couple of questions in already from people who are registered, which is great. So I'll drop those in as we go forward, and uh, we'll move on from there. Thanks, Jamie. So I'm just going to do a bit of an update on the uh, on the actual strategic dairy farm uh, activity that we're uh, we're going through already. So uh, we look to uh, develop this network as a way of uh, sharing farmer to farmer learning, and uh, it's been going since 2018. Uh, we have uh, it's it's about the people, and uh, Arthur Owen there on the left hand side is one of our strategic dairy farms in Wales. Uh, but we have 22 across the uh, three countries. Uh, we have five over in Wales. We've got two up in Scotland, and then the uh, the, the rest spread well across uh, well across England now. Uh, I'll come on to uh, your opportunity to uh, become part of that network in a moment or two. But it's about the people, so it's about those 22 strategic dairy farms. But it's also about the team who support the uh, uh, the activity. The knowledge exchange team who uh, who support the delivery of those. Thank you, Jamie. So, along with uh, that sharing of uh, experience and knowledge that we've tried to do over the years, uh, we've also uh, recently recognised the uh, uh, the importance of sharing around sustainability and the environment. So, of the uh, of the 22 farms, 12 of those this year have had carbon footprints carried out. Uh, by SAC ADAS's uh, AgriCalc tool. And um, the uh, findings we will be sharing, but not only individually with the, uh, uh, with the farms at the uh, open events and, and webinars, but we'll also be looking to try and do a webinar around the wider, wider activity around those carbon footprints because we've uh, across other sectors as well. So that's been an important part. We did do a webinar back in March. So if you're interested in sustainability and, and carbon footprinting, 
and the wider connotations to the dairy industry, then do look up that uh, that event. It was uh, an hour or so of, of of detail and really a good introduction into uh, into the environment for those who haven't yet uh, engaged with that. Thanks, Jamie. So I talked about uh, the opportunity for uh, you as farmers and uh, the network continues. So we uh, we rotate farms on a regular basis. So uh, we we do need new farms. Uh, we launched nine new farms last year. But uh, as it is, we have some farms coming to the end of their time uh, as strategic farms this year. So we're looking to uh, continue to recruit. The two blue circles there on the map in Scotland and Wales are, are two areas where we have found farms and we're just going through the process of bringing those on board. But also uh, across the across the countries, we're looking for new farms, especially in those uh, those circles there where we need to uh, uh, replace farms who are coming to the end of their tenure. And uh, it would be good to be able to uh, bring new farms on. So please do make contact with uh, with ourselves through uh, putting a message in the in the question box or uh, or even uh, uh, making contact with your knowledge exchange manager uh, through the HDB website. So strategic dairy farms, the way that we have, were working had to change during COVID. So uh, uh, the way the future looks now is very much a, a hybrid of physical meetings as we were and uh, very much the digital delivery we've done over the last 14 months. So if you look out for that email that comes in on a Monday, for those who are registered, if you're not registered, then look on the uh, keeping in touch, uh, keeping in touch form that will come through on the email and make sure that you uh, have a look at that. That will highlight the physical and the digital uh, digital events that are going on. We uh, continue that rotation of, of farms, as I say, on a three year rotation. So. Uh, consider the opportunity and if you're uh, specifically moving forward with environment and, and sustainability activity uh, I'm looking as as head of dairy development to try and bring on three farms of uh, uh, really focusing on that kind of more uh, sustainable uh, uh, direction that dairy is going to go and we just continue to look at different ways so we've had a very successful delivery of digital uh, audience uh, figures and uh, numbers through the, the last year. So we'll continue to look at different ways of reaching new audiences and helping farmers to uh, learn from other farmers, which I hope to do today. Thank you. So the KPI Express tool is uh, the uh, uh, tool where, where we can encourage people to benchmark and uh, there's not enough dairy farmers still benchmarking themselves against uh, industry targets and against other people. So we, uh, we've got this tool, it's, it's coming round for nine months old now, and uh, there's an opportunity to, uh, to look at one KPI or all nine, and uh, really look at how you are, uh, how you're faring, and, and you can compare yourself to the uh, KPIs from each of the strategic dairy farms on the website. And also, I think for those, and we've got a nice mix of people on the call uh, on the webinar today, and, and consultants, there is now an option within the KPI tool for you to put the information in on behalf of farmers and be able to pull that information out for, uh, for the benefit of the farm conversation that you're having and the farmers that you're working with. So I'd urge you to have a look as well at the option to, uh, to look at those KPIs and, and develop that conversation with the farmer. And then we're looking at the uh, way that we can use use some of those KPIs as a as a good example or a good measurement of uh, of the environmental measures that farmers are now needing to start to consider. So the website uh, page is there, uh, but it will also be in the email that follows this uh, this webinar today. Thank you, Jamie. So I'll uh, just invite Shane to uh, uh, to come on and uh, just talk around uh, a few areas that Buscot WIC has uh, has been working on and, and uh, developed since the last webinar that we held uh, back in the autumn of last uh, last year. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Nick. Um, just uh, yeah, just a bit of an overview about where we're at um, and how we've been doing. Um, so at the moment, current milking numbers is 283 cows in milk. Um, 
and we have some early dry offs. Our, early, our cows will be dried off early, sorry. Um, there's 22 of those. Um, our, our low group, which is basically, uh, apart from a few culls, is all our um, cows that we are going to dry off very soon. Um, there's 198 lows, and then we have a small group of high yielders, um, 85 in that group, which is made up of a small spring calving block that we've had and carryovers from last autumn that didn't get in calf, but are still milking, um, still milking very well. So we will, we're basically on the point of drying off the first ones. Um, and we are due to start calving on the 18th of August and hopefully everything will be finished by the 15th of November. All going well. Um, milk production at the moment, because we've got so many lows, it's 18.2 litres over the whole, the whole herd. Um, the lows are doing about 16 litres. Highs are doing 24 litres average, but that is, yeah, half of those are carryovers. Um, the butter fat and protein at the moment is 4.1 and 3.55, which is, yeah, it's pretty good, really. Um, the highs are being buffer fed. They're out on grass twice a day, but they're still being buffer fed after milking. So they're getting eight kilos of dry matter ahead. Um, within that that's a five kilo concentrate mix of mainly rape meal with some dry distillers and some crimp maize um so they're they're doing well um especially with the amount of grass that they're getting um as far as fertility figures went um we don't we did well uh we had 88% of our breeding group of the cows in calf by the end of the breeding season. 60% um, in calf to first insemination. Um, we use a sense of activity collar system, which is fantastic. Um, so it does eliminate a lot of guessing. Um, and it is very good with picking up non bullers problem cows, which we did have a few uh, issues, which Heffin will talk about later. But it was it was on it was carried on from the transition period and the calving period. We did have a lot of cystic cows, um, but we we found them with our vet um, and we treated them and we we done very well with them, majority of them. Um, the heifers, last year's heifers. So four didn't get in calf out of 149, which is not, not bad. Um, and then, but we did use a lot of sex semen on them. The, they all got one, one go of sex semen, but we only had a 50% hit rate on that. Um, but we, we know where we, we fell down um, and everything's in calf, so can't complain too much. Um, at the moment, yeah, the current time in the season really is pretty quiet. There's four staff members, so pretty much everybody. Someone is off um, just to yeah recharge the batteries before it get, gets busy in August. Um, and it's, yeah, all the cows are outside. All the young stock is outside. There's very little feeding to do. Um, yeah, so we're just, we're just tipping along. Basically, we'll start a big group of dry offs this week, and then it'll be routine for every week. We'll do a decent chunk. I'd, 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 do, I'd rather do sort of um, easier, easier groups rather than do a blanket and do a lot because um, it's just easier on everybody. It's easier on the cows and it's easier on the staff as well. Um, yeah, young stock at the moment. Yeah, as I say, we have 145 in calf. Um, 20 to 22 month old heifers and they're doing super well they're on river meadow out farms um looking really good um ready to ready to go in august september um and then we have 130 young heifers they're eight to ten months old they were born last autumn doing well as well they're on a, another out farm that's along the river meadow so they've plenty of feed 
um, looking after themselves and they hopefully be raring to go. They'll come back in in October to settle into a ration for AIing um, in November. And forage, so yeah, weather I think was a problem for everybody, but we were a bit late cutting our first cut, um, but it was still very good. It was a good, it was a good yield. It was, it's a good crop. The second cut then, we will go a little bit earlier um, to get the quality, but also because we'll be harvesting um, on the arable side of the farm. So it's just from a labor point of view as well. So our second cut should be super, hopefully. And we have 350 acres of maize in, that is roughly about half and half will go to forage maize and the other half will go to crimping. Um, we do feed a lot of crimp through the winter. Um, and then, yeah, the season has been pretty good. So we, we are happy with the grass we have and um, we've got plenty of standing hay coming on. The heifer we'll talk about later coming on for the dry cows. So, yeah, everything's, everything's going well. That's good. That's a great uh, that's a great picture. Uh, thanks, Shane. Uh, Phil, I don't know if you've got anything you wanted to add or anything you, you think over the top of that. But, uh, um, yeah, probably only, <clears throat> the only thing to, to add was we took the decision that we had a small group of spring carvers and this handful of, of, of better um, cows which had, had not got back in calf in the autumn block. So we we took the view that we'd try and roll them round, which is why we're feeding. But it kind of sums up why we want to get rid of the spring carvers because the only the only real job at the moment is is doing a, a bit of buffer feeding for this spring carving group to, to to keep the milk up on them um so hopefully this time next year we'll we'll we will have no spring carving group and we'll have um uh we'll we'll all be able to be off on holiday um rather than just one at a time so so yeah if yeah. uh corridors allowing or whatever yeah yes yeah if you're allowed to uh, get away uh yes excellent okay thanks phil and with regards to that 50% uh, replacement rate, uh, Shane, that um, you, you came on to, that's, that's clearly high. Is that to try and replace these ones that uh, uh, currently are out of, out of sync? Sorry, no, it was 50% um, in calf to the right. sexy used in the heifer group. So the, our replacements, we hopefully will have 160 heifers, heifer calves on the ground from the autumn 2021 group. Um, so we'll have we we will have a surplus of replacements, but okay. we we do have yeah. There's a bit of neospora knocking around the farm, which knocked our numbers a little bit, and TB is is still a problem here, um, which did knock our numbers back a bit too. So we always have a bit extra um, for those eventualities. Yeah. Good. Okay. Right. Appreciate that clarity. Thank you. Okay, well, I would encourage anybody else who has questions to uh, put them in the chat and we'll try and pick those up as we uh, as we go through. But uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Heaven Richards uh, uh, to come into uh, into the discussion uh, this afternoon. I think uh, Heaven's going to take on his uh, slides and uh, work through. I'm going to disappear off screen for a little while. And uh, we'll let uh, we'll come back in a bit. Uh, I'll try and pitch any questions I can as we uh, as we uh, as we go through. But Heaven, uh, all yours. Right. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you. Hopefully, you can see my opening slide: transition management for autumn carving herds. I'll just double check that before I go any further. Yes. Nick. Yes, we can. That's great. Right. So, um, what we're going to look at really is just general areas around transition, um, key key points, et cetera. Then what's sort of different or and possibly better or worse in terms of um, transition management and the challenges of block autumn carving, and then move on and look more specifically at some of the issues and some of the, uh, the strategies we're hoping to implement at Busket Wick. So uh, in my sort of day-to-day -day work as a nutrition consultant, um, you know, we have a lot of discussions about a lot of things, but if we think about the milk production cycle, we go obviously from calving through to cows coming into milk. We then want them to cycle, conceive, and then just cruise on, ready to dry off and repeat. So a lot of conversations 
do revolve around milk production. Everybody generally wants a little bit more. Uh, we have a lot of con conversations about fertility, so getting cows back in calf, obviously, that's a big discussion point. Uh, however, both of these are often linked back to what's happened in this period here in red, i.e. dry off through to calving. So it's it's very easy to try and focus on the here and now and what's happening uh, in the short term, whether that's in terms of milk production or fertility. But very often we do need to look back and think, has has have we got off to a good start around transition? Is that actually hampering production? and subsequent health and fertility later on so it's an area where i i strongly believe that if we if we put more focus and more attention on we will inevitably and invariably see benefits in terms of production health and particularly fertility so transition goals pretty straightforward i think we want a live health and live and healthy cow and calf obviously that's the the ultimate aim we want to avoid clinical milk fever, retain fetal membranes or retain cleansings, metritis and ketosis. So all of those sort of clinical issues, uh, I think we'd all agree are, are, are not good. And therefore we want to absolutely take all the steps we can to, to minimize and avoid any of those. We want a good yield of quality colostrum. So again, you know, we're learning all the time about the value of colostrum, how important it is to get good quality colostrum into calves, be it you know the next generation of heifers or beef calves so you know that's another thing which is impacted on by uh, sort of nutrition around transition we want a cow and a heifer with, with a good appetite post calving to restore that room and fill uh, we know that feed intake drops off dramatically in the days before calving uh, and therefore we we have a real uh, aim to to restore feed intake and get good room and fill as quickly as possible after calving and that's something we'll we'll touch on a bit later on we want a nice steady rise in milk yield so cows that come into milk and and get going uh, in in sort of parallel with with their appetite and we don't want displaced abomasums because again the incidence of these very often historically there'd be a tendency to think oh it's it's linked to the milking cow diet solely it's linked to fiber levels etc but invariably uh, DAs are linked to transition success and uh, prevalence of ketosis so you know again they are indicators in most cases that uh, transition has not been as we'd have liked so I've used this this sort of diagram for a number of years because I think it's very important that we look holistically at transition and what's what's impacting on it so um, I think one of the first things that comes to mind with people is is the diet well the diet is important uh, however it's not the only thing that's important so i think at the top of the triangle we've got the cow because um we could we could feed a certain transition diet but depending on what sort of state the cows are in coming on to that will determine whether they transition well or not so the diet is there obviously to support the cow but also the environment will have a significant impact. And I think this is something, you know, in the last five to 10 years that I've become acutely aware of the impact of environment on transition and then management. So these are areas we're going to look at more individually uh, as we look at sort of general transition. So the cow, the diet, the environment and management as four distinct areas, which may or may not, not be good on your farm. So I think if you, if you remember to look at these four general areas, uh, you might identify, well, that the issues are more to do with environment or management than diet say or the cows or vice versa so examples of cow factors would be body condition um, a huge amount of work showing the impact of body condition on transition success over conditioned cows generally more problematic in terms of poor transition more prone to milk fever more prone to ketosis displaced abomasums etc so body condition at calving obviously linked back to body condition at dry off we certainly don't want to be tending to, to make making any significant changes to body condition in the dry period so we're really back into late lactation and trying to manage body condition there if at all possible this will very often be linked to lactation length so uh, it, you know good body condition management will often go hand in hand with good fertility so cows that have calved back within a reasonable length of time will generally be a generally be a lot lower risk of high body condition than cows that have had long lactations and multiple breedings. So the actual body condition is important. The trend, i.e. 
have they dried off in one condition and then they've changed noticeably in the dry period? That's something we want to try and avoid. And then the issue of assessment of body condition in terms of uh, continuity and consistency between assessors. But also uh, one of the challenges certainly on farms uh, like Buscut Wick where we've got a, a, a range of genetics and crossbreds in there is that it's, it's a lot harder perhaps to get agreement on body condition between say a, a pure Holstein type cow and an animal which is 50% fleck fee for example. So you know it's not without its challenges but it's certainly an important issue from a cow point of view. Parity will have an impact. So first lactation animals versus mature cows, they actually have different challenges. They all have challenges around uh, transition. And this is something that we, we, we flagged up on the heifer rearing webinar a few months ago at Buscat Wick, that uh, you know, there's a feeling that, that first lactation animals were having a bit of a raw deal. Um, so first lactation animals have this whole issue of their first calving. Very often it's the first uh, sort of time they're mixed with mature cows. They go from being the biggest animals in the group to being the smallest, you know, very, very susceptible to bullying. Uh, but then as cows mature and they've had multiple calves, then they're obviously more prone to calcium related issues, milk fever, retain cleansings, etc. cetera. So uh, cow factors will be different depending on, on the number of uh, calves the animal has had. So the history of that individual cow, so the previous lactation, dry period length, has she had a long lactation? Did she take a long time to get in calf? Did she lose milk in mid lactation because of lameness or something or a diet change and therefore go on and, and put condition on? So individual cows can very often give us an indication as to why perhaps uh, they've struggled with transition next time round. Any underlying health issues will, will have a negative effect. So lameness coming through the dry period is a complete disaster, um, but also any ruminant issues and liver function is very, very important at calving. So if we've got a degree of fatty liver, poor liver function, for example, due to fluke, et cetera, uh, these are all cow factors which are negative in terms of transition success. So then we look at the diet. Well, I think the first question is, is it fit for purpose? There are any number of, uh, of strategies out there for feeding dry cows. And in, in many cases, they can work absolutely fine. It's about just adopting some key principles uh, and then finding what, what works for your individual farm, depending on your feeding system, calving season, etc. So I think the, the key question there, is it fit for purpose? Is it suitable in terms of energy density, protein supply, palatability, presentation, mineral balance uh, for a dry cow? Basic requirements, in my view, are that we should meet but not exceed energy requirements. We don't want to be putting condition on these cows while they're dry. That can be challenging where we strive to make high quality silage for milking cows. So we, as we move perhaps towards multi-cut systems, um, we then start to look for something distinctly different for dry cows because 11 and a half to 12 me silage for dry cows will lead to excessive weight gain in the dry period and run into a lot of problems. We need to meet protein requirements because we've got a, obviously a rapidly developing fetus. We've got a cow producing uh, hopefully a good yield of colostrum and we don't want her depleting her protein reserves. So it's important that we feed enough of the right type and quality of protein. Uh, the diet needs to prevent hypocalcemia. So we don't want milk fever. So we need to look at the various options that are out there in term, terms of managing that. We want to promote good rumoured health and function so that the animal calves again with a good strong appetite and is in a position to utilise the milking diet, uh, whatever that may be. I think one of the key things to take away is that diet formulation is only one part of the story. Feed presentation, delivery, trough management will make or break the dry cow programme. We could feed the same dry cow diet on 10 different farms and get 10 different outcomes, solely down to how it's presented, how much feed space they have, are the troughs clean, are they well managed, is the food fresh, how much room do they have, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, just because you've got a well formulated diet, don't think that that is uh, the be all and end all. The challenges are always linked to high potassium green forages. So grazing, high quality grass silage, particularly grass silage in general to a large degree, uh, these products are high in potassium and of all the minerals, potassium is probably the biggest issue that we have uh, when it comes to managing uh, the, the, the mineral balance of dry cows. Not an issue for milking cows, but for dry cows, potassium is our biggest enemy. 
Uh, another another issue is the consistency of the forage base. So if we're feeding dry cows from the same clamp as, as the milkers, we will naturally have uh, multiple cuts to feed through the season. And obviously, as we move through the clamp, we go from one field to another. So the forage mineral base will, will change quite dra dramatically. Um, there is a shift, on, certainly on some larger herds now, to perhaps try and make some dedicated dry cow forage either from some very mature uh, sort of unfertilized grass, permanent pasture type grasses, or products such as forage rye, where we've got a single cut uh, sort of base forage, which will be there predominantly, if not solely as a dry cow feed. The other challenge is maintaining dry matter intake. Uh, and again, this is a particular challenge with sort of summer and autumn, autumn calving cows. So um, the environment, sorry. Sorry. Apologies uh, to jump in as, as early as I have, but I think it's, it's perfectly timed to the, the last points in that uh, in that slide. That uh, one of the questions that's come in, if you don't mind me uh, just jumping in there. No, by all means. So it says uh, it's important to keep soil P and K levels to a minimum in standing hay for autumn carvers, therefore not to apply them to uh, carving paddocks as artificial or organic fertilizers. But if the growing season management doesn't allow the laying up of fields for calving early enough, can the farmer apply nitrogen to boost growth to catch up and gain the covers of grass needed to support the dry cow numbers on farm? Uh, that's uh, um, that's come in earlier. Uh, don't know right. That's a, yeah, a very very good question. Um, the issue is is predominantly potassium potash rather than phosphorus um, and, and yeah what tends to happen is we have what we call luxury uptake so when the grass starts to grow it takes up a huge amount of, phos of potash sorry uh, in that initial growth as the plant matures uh, we get some dilution so the more sort of biomass um, sort of accumulated as as the plant grows and and sort of uh, we get more stem and it goes to seed then we do get a bit of dilution in terms of the, the potash content um, it's an interesting point uh, in terms of putting straight nitrogen on in order to sort of drive that growth um, I guess it's, it's, it's a bit of a, I'm going to give a bit of political answer because it's probably there are probably pros and cons one uh, if we do get that growth and we get therefore a bigger accumulation of dry matter there should logically be a bit of dilution uh, however we are going to tend to find more concentration of potash in the green uh, lush early growth so um, it's it's a tricky one really because i think it would then very much depend on when they actually accessed it and whether there was more leafy material that they would then tend to graze in preference to the, the more stalky material versus whether we can just get uh, you know a much more controlled intake of, of of the stemming material as well it is a challenge uh, particularly where animals are on the same area year after year because we tend to get a, a gradual increase in potash record in potash sort of indices so um yeah it, it is very much about going for that dilution through having a big bulky crop of mature material however you can reach that but i think generally uh, it's it's about time and giving it a long time to grow and, and and really bulk up appreciate that thanks that's a good start and I encourage just others to uh, pitch in questions as we uh, as we go forward thanks i'll leave you uh, leave you to it okay so then moving on to the environmental factors so lying space and time certainly when 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 dry cows are housed the target lying areas are rarely achieved, and this is an even bigger challenge on block carving herds because obviously um, there's there's a big intensity of carving uh, in a relatively short period of time. So that is certainly an environmental factor that we we regularly come across as being a limiting factor. So you know, with, with tendency then to think, well, if we let them run in and out of sheds, etc., that gives us a lot more space and, and a lot more lying time. But we then have to sort of counter that with the the risk of excessive grass intake again if they're in cubicles stall comfort bedding lying time ease of movement you know we, these cows are at the biggest they're at in their in their in their annual cycle so if they're going to be in stalls or cubicles um you know those need to be suitable for animals at that stage in the cycle 
Ventilation, well, again, we often carve cows where we've always carved them. Uh, they're often older buildings. And again, with herd expansion, um, there, there are often a few more animals in there than, than would be ideal. And ventilation is often a challenge. And again, this is generally a much bigger issue in the summer than in the winter. Uh, and lo and behold, with an autumn carving herd, when are we trying to manage dry cows and, and transition cows in the summer? So ventilation is definitely one to look at. This is linked into managing heat stress. They're, the two things are linked, although they're not they're not directly the same thing. So ventilation is about making sure that there's enough good quality air so that cows are comfortable lying down and, and just exhibiting normal behaviour. Um, heat stress uh, is, is a huge risk uh, with dry cows through the summer months, and we see it every year. Uh, and again, it's, it's certainly a very big risk, obviously, where we've got to block autumn carving herd because they are all essentially dry at a period of time when heat stress is at risk. Uh, there's work from the States showing the impact of heat stress dry cows on milk production being significant, you know, possibly up to a thousand litres lost in the, in the subsequent lactation. Uh, impact on um, calf birth weight, colostrum yield, colostrum quality, uh, but also calf vigour and fascinatingly the milk production of the offspring. So they're showing that calves born to heat stressed cows go on to produce less milk uh, when they in turn enter the milking herd. So heat stress is something I think we're learning more about all the time. Uh, and, and certainly the more I look at it, the more uh, we're drawn to say, well, you know, the absolute high priority group are the transition cows because it has such a negative effect on virtually all aspects of transition. Water provision and access, so again, you know, same old story, clean water, you know, good access. We want really minimum 10 centimetres per cow and more than one trough. Um, you know, the transition group are a very dynamic group. The pecking order tends to be very fluid and uh, the sort of the dominant bully cows are very, very good and very clever uh, at, at realising where they can assert their dominance and a, a single water trough gives them a very, very powerful position. So they know if they can guard that, they really uh, can start to command some respect. So if we can you know, have more than one water trough for that group, it certainly uh, uh, puts a bit of pressure on that, that dominance and it makes sure that subservient animals can get to drink. Feed space requirement, again, widely underestimated by farmers. These cows are at their, their largest in the cycle, but also because it's a very dynamic group uh, and, and animals you know, will will tend to work out where the pecking order is. We do need more feed space, and really, we should be targeting about a metre a cow uh, in in this transition period to make sure that animals that are sort of shy feeders can come come and eat and, and get enough food on board rather than feel intimidated. Feed presentation and access very tempting to feed every other day. Uh, in reality, it's rarely a good idea. Uh, feed does deteriorate. We're talking about high ambient temperatures, and again. You know, if feed isn't accessible the whole time, uh, we came across one herd last year where it turned out the transition cows were shut away from feed for eight hours because milkers needed to move back and forth on the way to the parlour. So again, you know, this uh, really flagged up why we were seeing below target intakes in in the transition cows. So, you know, really critically look at the whole environment in terms of uh, housing and feed presentation and access. Like I say, the group dynamics, they're a very socially unstable group. Uh, there are animals carving and leaving the group, and there are animals generally entering the group uh, very, very frequently. Uh, so again, we have to be aware of that. And, and what we can do to try and minimise the impact of that is to give them more room, more room to eat, more room to drink, and also make sure that we haven't got things like dead end corners where, uh, you know, shy animals, and particularly heifers, will feel intimidated and, and at risk. Management factors would include age, size, body condition score at first carving, very important with heifers. And again, obviously block carving, we are carving heifers in at 24 months or less. So we need to make sure that those animals are at the appropriate size uh, and also at the right body condition score at first carving to give them a good, as good a chance as possible. With cows, like I said, body condition score at dry, dry off, you know, how we manage these late lactation cows in terms of feed provision, grazing management, supplementary concentrates, that's very important as well to do that pre-dry off. Locomotion, very important, 
ongoing lameness going through the dry period, like I said earlier, is a complete disaster. So that's very much a management factor. So, you know, managing foot health prior to dry off uh, will always pay dividends. How do we introduce heifers to the herd? Do they introduce to the milking herd or to the dry, sorry, to the far off dries? Are they coming in close to calving? Are they coming in at the point of calving? So yes, in most herds, they are going to be mixed with adult cows. We need to think, well, when when can we best do that? Personally, I think if they're going to be mixed with adult cows, it needs to be at least a month pre-calving to allow them to kind of settle into that dynamic um, and ideally not very close to calving because it's a further stress um, where they're, 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 they're mixing with adult cows for the first time. In, in herds where they're going to be separate post-calving, then it's probably worth trying to uh, keep them separate as far as possible pre-calving if buildings etc allow. So group change management and timing. So again, if we're going to bring animals into the transition group, it's better to do it weekly rather than two or three times a week. Again, just in order to minimize the amount of sort of churn of, of this whole social structure. If we're bringing more cows into that group every two or three days, that, that group is constantly in a, in, a, in a state of change in terms of the pecking order. So we need to try and bring animals in, let them settle, and then obviously uh, replenish animals that have calved perhaps a week later. The ultimate really is socially stable groups. This works very well, where we form animals into groups, perhaps three, four weeks pre-calving, and then they stay within that, that mini group right the way through to calving. You know, it does present logistical challenges in a lot of farms. However, those that are managing to apply it, I think um, are finding some real benefits in terms of avoiding this whole issue of bullying and, and fighting uh, in, the, in the immediate run-up to calving. Feed provision and bunk management. So again, things like making sure that they don't run out of food, but also that feed bunks are kept clean and food is kept fresh and palatable. So very much a management factor. Um, things like diet sourcing on straw-based diets, um, quality of forage, hygiene of clamp management, etc. All of these management factors will have a huge effect. And we need to get away from the idea that, well, we give the good stuff to the milking cows. And if there's anything second quality, we give it to the dries because that is not healthy and is not what we're trying to achieve. Carving supervision uh, and post-carving protocols. It's, um, I think if, if, if the general sort of system is working well and cows are generally getting on and carving, Minimal supervision is the order of the day. I think um, in many herds, they, they, there are more problems through over supervision and over intervention than, um, than, than under. So I think, you know, if, if the basics are right, it's, it's generally a matter of, of let them get on with it uh, in their own time, minimize stress and only intervene if you really feel uh, that it's necessary and again post carving protocols whether that's calcium boluses fresh cow drinks checks etc it's important to have a protocol and make sure that everyone within the team understands what the protocol is and and adopts a, a consistent approach because uh, we come across farms where different people do different things and it's very hard then to get a steer on what's working and what isn't and what has actually happened to individual cows the fresh cow protocols post carving again monitoring what's going on, recording that, ensuring that we can then assess the success or otherwise of the transition uh, and make changes as required going forward. Transition has a huge impact on immune function. So again, where we're looking at reducing antibiotic use, reducing replacement rates, uh, and generally improving cow health and welfare. Uh, it's very important to, to understand the role of the transition period on immune function and uh, metabolic disease management. So immune function is downgraded around calving. This is a physiological response to protect the fetus. So as the animal gets close to calving, um, if, if the immune system was going sort of at full bore, it would identify the fetus as, as something uh, sort of alien to it and, and therefore uh, try and get rid. So what we what we have in, in virtually all species is a reduction in immune function around calving. So this is great for the fetus, but it's not great when we're trying to minimize the risk of, um, of transition disease. 
So it remains low beyond calving, and this has implications for infectious disease post-calving, such as metritis, mastitis, lameness, and respiratory infection. So obviously, metritis is an issue that we do automatically link to freshly calved cows, but we also tend to see quite a big prevalence of mastitis in freshly calved cows again, largely because uh, of, of, of a weakened immune system, which is then allowing uh, the, the, the bacteria to, to take hold and, and cause infection. So firstly, I think it's important to be aware of that, but also it's important to be aware that we can exacerbate and extend that issue uh, if we have uh, certainly ketosis related issues going on. So if we have poor transition and then we have a cow that becomes ketotic and she has a, an energy deficit due to poor appetite and all the rest of it, she's, she's more likely to succumb to those kind of diseases uh, and infections than a cow that's transitioned well and, and gets into a, a more positive energy status quickly. So uh, don't underestimate the impact of transition on post-calving uh, infections, uh, whether it's metritis, mastitis, or lameness. This has implications for fresh cow mastitis. And again, you know, um, selective dry cow therapy is is increasingly being used and, and there's a, in the future will be probably even more increasingly used. Uh, so again, we need to really look at the other tools in the toolbox in terms of making sure that those cows don't succumb to, uh, to infection post-calving. Rumen fill. Well, now this is this is a really good indicator of feed intake. Um, if we were able to individually measure feed intake on individual cows, we would find transition cows that are heading towards problems would would alert us fairly quickly. Um, Shane mentioned earlier they've got sort of activity monitoring collars on. You know. So rumination, et cetera, is a useful indicator of what's going on. Um, some systems are now looking at sort of feeding time and increasingly uh, the, the sort of the interest is in identifying individual cows that are perhaps not following the normal curve, say, in terms of feed intake in the run up to calving. However, in the absence of those, what we can use very quickly and very easily is room and fill because room and fill uh, looked at regularly on particularly the close-up group uh, gives us our cheapest indicator of feed intake. Uh, Premier Nutrition who run what they call the transition management system uh, and record data on a huge number of cows across the country every year. Uh, they've produced some very very good data looking at rumen fill scores in pre-calving cows and linked it to milk production at four weeks. And what this has clearly shown, and this was data back from 2019, which has been repeated since, is that room and fill score one, which is effectively a very empty cow, which we would hope not to see or very rarely see, uh, those animals that had a room and fill score of one pre-calving, so probably two to three weeks pre-calving, by week four in lactation, we're giving 28.6 litres. The ones with the rumen fill score of two, which were somewhat better, were up at 32. However, rumen fill scores of three and above, which is where we should be with dry cows, were 39, 40, and 41 litres a day. So in very simple terms, getting from ones and twos to threes and fours was worth 10 litres a cow a day post-calving. So Room and fill is very important. And if we identify on a group level that room and fill is below target, then we need to look at feed access, feed provision, sorting, are they running out? Have they got enough space, et cetera? If we're looking at individuals within a group with low room and fill, then those animals need further investigation because there's something going on. Uh, I room and fill scored a herd the other week and we flagged up two that were below room and fill score of three and they were both lame. So it very clearly showed the impact of lameness on room and fill score. And when we look at this data, that could be costing us 10 litres a day post-carving. So room and fill score is a really, really good tool, very quick and easy to do. Uh, and, it, and it just allows you to flag up those cows that aren't where they should be in terms of feed intake. Evan, AHTB just, have got, sorry. Can I just, you're right. No, just wanted to give you, uh, give you half a, half a second to breathe and uh, appreciate um, I'm part way through that room and fill piece. 
but I'm getting uh, a significant number of questions. So I just wanted to pop a couple in which do fit with Room and Phil to a point of uh, the forage that's going in. So uh, just hold there for a sec. And uh, so question, uh, where does hay play a part uh, in dry cow stroke uh, calving cows diets? And to fit in with that, also I've got a question with regards to can whole crop play a part within transition? So both those fit with regards to uh, what forages, and you may feel that uh, you can you can carry those through uh, to a to an appropriate pass. And also lush grass. Uh, someone's asked the question with regards to with with lush grass, recognizing the risk of milk fever. Are there any other significant risks with regards to uh, using green lush grass to uh, uh, again to to transition animals? Thank you. Right. Okay. Well, I think yeah, I think we'll hit hit those here. Um, yeah. Hay. Hay is is quite a variable product. So there is there is hay and there's hay. So um, certainly, sort of some some stemmy mature hay from some permanent pasture with a low potash content can be a, you know a very useful dry cow food. Um, equally, we could have some higher quality hay with a high potash content, which will be quite problematic. So um, I think with hay, I would always recommend getting a mineral analysis done just to see what the underlying background mineral levels are, particularly in terms of potassium. Um, but it can certainly have a part to play. And, and certainly this winter, uh, I've had a number of herds where we've used a combination of chopped straw and chopped hay together because of straw price and availability. And, um, and you know, we, we just had to take that into account. So hay does, does play a part, particularly off uh, suitable land. Whole crop, um, generally, yes, a very useful product, um, generally significantly lower in potash than grass, um, pretty consistent, uh, quite fibrous, a little bit of starch, uh, and, and certainly um, that's where a lot of the interest now in, in whole crop rye is coming in, where it's a, a lower energy density, high straw content product uh, with, a, with, a, with a, you know, a very low grain level at the point of harvest. So again, it's about trying to produce consistent bulky fibre to maintain good room and fill with a, with a very uh, safe uh, mineral level. Um, green grass, yeah, certainly the highest risk product in terms of, of milk fever, but also because of the digestibility and the rate of passage, i.e. how quickly it, it flies through the rumen, um, you know, is really not giving much rumen fill at all. So um, obviously the more sort of lush young grass that they're eating, the, the more quickly they'll have their energy requirement met and therefore the less they will eat. So it's a pretty big challenge to then step up to meet energy requirement post calving when milk is starting to be produced in quantity uh, when the animal has been be sort of able to satisfy its low energy requirement from a, a very small package of, of you know young leafy grass which will have probably an ME of 12 or above um, and of course the other point I make about dry cows is they've got nothing else to do all day they can just mooch around and and pick the very nicest leafiest youngest blades of grass that, that, that are in the field they're, they're certainly not going to be too bothered about eating the fibre so room and fill and uh, mineral balance with green grass are, are real challenges. Brilliant, I appreciate so, letting you crack on, thank you. Right so in terms of scoring room and fill, AHDB have got a really good resource online. Uh, it's, it's pictorial, so it's very, very easy. Body condition score is always, there's always a little bit more debate, but I think room and fill score is something people can learn very quickly and, and apply very consistently. So here we've got a room and fill score one. What we're looking at on the left hand side of the cow is this area here from behind the rib. And we're looking at this triangle here. So this is a room and fill score one uh, and as a dry cow we do not want to see any ones at all so you know that cow is clearly hollow and has got very poor room and fill uh, we then come down to here and we can see we can still make out the triangle um, but you know there's a little bit more cover and the, the the skin is certainly a little bit more distended so you know that's a two but again in the dry yard uh, we don't want to be seeing twos either threes yeah you'll notice the difference there between a two and a three. So I think any of you looking at these pictures and looking at your cows would, would, would easily identify where three and above sits. So again, just about make out the triangle, the, the top line is visible, but uh, it's, it's generally coming out a lot fuller and flatter. And certainly a big contrast between a one and a three. Four, we're looking at virtually flat. 
and then a five it's completely uh, pushed out so if we can aim for threes fours and the odd five uh, we're, we really are making progress and like I say individuals that uh, are sort of falling into these categories have usually got something else going on there is possibly some lameness there are over conditioned cows that have got poor appetites pre calving and they're cows that if nothing else you just flag up as being at risk of problems around calving and you know any additional steps you can do around calving in terms of a bit of TLC will pay dividends but you know room and fill does give you an early warning I think to potential problems uh, either at individual cow level or at group level so the ration considerations, I'm not going to get into too much detail here because we could be here all day talking about nothing but the actual uh, formulation of the rations. But the energy density will, will to a degree, control and drive dry matter intake. Um, if we increase the energy density too much, they will tend to sort of throttle back and eat a little bit less. So we want to keep a sort of a, a, a pretty safe and moderate energy density to encourage cows to keep eating so that we get this good room and fill uh, as close to calving as possible. So protein is important because microbial protein is derived from the rumen supply and then some bypass protein uh, coming in from feeds as well. So like I say, they're developing that calf, they're developing, uh, you know, they're, they're filling the udder with colostrum. So there's a big protein demand that if we don't meet that requirement, uh, that cow is going to start to draw off her own protein reserves, which will have an impact on, on milk yield and milk protein post-calving. Minerals, we need to manage the cation intake, so that's particularly potassium and sodium, uh, and potentially counter those with anionic salts, so uh, chlorides and sulfates, etc. So the problem is where we've got a high potassium forage, we can't take that out. All we're faced with doing is trying to counteract it with uh, um, anions that will 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 hopefully alleviate the issue from the potassium and the sodium being the two strong cations that, that are in the forages what route we go down we can go down what we call a semi decad diet or a full decad diet in the close up to calving group uh, these are very much farm specific and one size most definitely doesn't fit all it's about finding the strategy that works on your farm um, from a milk fever point of view calcium binders uh, certainly work uh, if they're fed two to three weeks pre-calving they're not a particularly cheap option but they are a pretty reliable option in terms of managing milk fever uh, where perhaps uh, your system doesn't allow use of any alternative forages uh, and you are calving particularly at grass uh, a lot of interest in looking at lower potassium forages so chopped straw whole crop rye etc producing uh, feeds which are more in tune with the requirement of the dry cows so whether that's like I say mature silage off unfertilized and fields where slurry has not been applied uh, in order to keep potash levels down or products such as whole crop rye trace minerals are important selenium zinc iodine all play a part in immune function so the source and level and supply uh, it's, it's it's worth feeding a good quality mineral supplement and then on the vitamin side well high vitamin e uh, as an antioxidant particularly will have positive benefits on immune function uh, and, and vitamin B for example on liver health so it's, it's worth just making sure that animals are well supplemented. We've got other products then such as niacin, rumor protected choline which is very effective if cows are over conditioned and then there's a lot of work coming through on the benefits of rumen protected methionine uh, in terms of milk production and liver health as well. So there's a lot going on with transition cow nutrition and management and, and like I say it's about finding the right sort of solution for your particular farm and system. So if we then start to apply these transition management challenges and, and, and aims to an autumn block calving herd there are positives and there are negatives. So personally I think one of the positives are that late lactation cows are grazed so if they're worked fairly hard at grass um, managing body condition is, is is pretty good so cows that are perhaps over conditioned can be turned out early and like I say grazed fairly hard and they will usually sharpen up a little bit with a view of drying off in in near perfect condition so that's certainly a lot more uh, advantageous than say fully housed herds where it's a lot more difficult to uh, to take condition off late lactation cows that have that have lost time 
So that's a real positive with autumn block calving. We can use that grazing period uh, not only to sort of reduce feed cost, but also to manage body condition. We've got meaningfully sized groups of cows to work with, so that's that's a plus as well because very often, particularly in smaller herds, you know, dry and transition groups are are relatively small, and it's and it limits what we can do. We should have no or very few long lactation animals because, again, by definition, the block have calved as a block, and therefore any animals which have drifted on have therefore left the herd. So body condition score a lot more manageable. And the other point is that we, we can focus on dry period and transition across the whole herd rather than being doing that whilst at the same time getting cows in calf, managing you know heifers at various stages, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, as we know, general advantages of block calving systems is that we've got some focus. The negatives would include the tighter the block, the more potential bottlenecks we've got. And I think this is something we've potentially identified at Buscot Wick. So bottlenecks could include housing and feed space, carving facilities, but also labour. So the tighter the block, the more pressure we put on any existing pinch points. Heifers at carving at under 24 months along a, alongside a very big percentage of these existing herds. So heifers obviously aiming to be carved at the beginning of the block uh, along with as many cows as possible so this really does concentrate the numbers coming through in those first weeks and and that's something we'll look at specifically at Buscot Wick a little bit later the other real negative from a nutritionist point of view is that you've got effectively one shot per year so there's no time to tinker with the diet we've got a kind of put a plan together that we're pretty confident will work because in an all year round calving herd we might say okay it's working okay we'll have a little tweak here and there give it another week or so see how things go the thing with block calving is you know in a week uh, we've we've carved another huge percentage of the herd and we're very quickly running out of time so we've got to sort of be fairly belt and braces in terms of putting together a diet and a, and a management system that we're confident will work from day one Again, uh, the impact of green forages, uh, and, and in many cases, autumn calving herds grazing or having access to grass running in and out as they do at Buscot Wick, and, and the impact of the variability of grass intake and availability in that area. So it, it really can throw in a curveball, uh, whereas obviously, if the cows are fully housed, we've got full control of what's going on. The impact of heat stress, we cannot ignore because again it's a huge risk through June to September not only from degrees centigrade but humidity and humidity is probably the biggest challenge in UK conditions uh, and like I say we're increasingly becoming aware of the impact of heat stress on pre-calving cows transition and their calves so you know if we're, if we're calving the whole herd in August and early September we are effectively putting all our dry cows dry at a time when heat stress is very much at risk of happening so i think that's one to be very aware of when it comes to looking at housing and and how we manage and how we feed them evan so, just sorry to butt in and it's it's very relevant with regards to that last point that there's been a question with regard to heat stress uh, come in and uh, the challenge of, of uh, where to find more information now, uh, I know we are, I don't know if you uh, you can help with that, Evan, but uh, I know we are renewing our uh, HDB uh, buildings guidance and, and so forth. So I'm sure there'll probably be a piece in that uh, coming out in the next uh, next few weeks. But uh, for those who are receiving the British Dairying Newsletter, uh, there is actually a specific piece this morning's uh, uh, piece through the British, uh, British Dairying Newsletter which is their e-newsletter, has a piece which is linked to a webinar. So if the person uh, wants to make contact with us uh, uh, after this uh, with regards to that uh, question, I can uh, try and get the link uh, for that. But uh, I don't know, Heaven, if you've got any other views uh, with regards to uh, where else to, to go for that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think if we, if we just apply sort of practical considerations in terms of managing heat stress, uh, we're very limited in terms of, of nutrition in what we can do with dry cows. There are certain things we can do with milkers that will, will help the situation. But with dry cows, it is very much back to trying to manage the environment and, and, and the day-to-day -day management of, of what's going on. So ventilation, fresh air, shade, 
water access, water cleanliness, um, feed hygiene, you know, being aware that, you know, when they have got heat stress issue, they're less likely to eat. So we need to make sure that food is fresh, palatable, troughs are ultra clean, water troughs are ultra clean, and again, be very, very aware about issues around overcrowding, et cetera, um, and all the rest of it. So we're limited as to what else we can do other than you know, give them plenty of fresh air. Fans work very, very well in sort of dry cow and calving areas. And I think personally, that would be the first place in a block calving herd that I would put fans uh, of any description because I think when it comes to sort of bang for your buck, um, it, it can have a bigger impact there than than, than anywhere else. But um, it's one to be aware of. And like I say, just really come back to housekeeping in terms of feed and water management and, uh, and 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 also be aware that you know there may well be a wobble on the back of a, a spell of hot weather as we've actually already seen in a lot of all year round carving herds already on the back of the last week 10 days just running into one or two issues which you know a fortnight ago weren't there yeah yeah and just uh, just a quickie for you uh, what energy density should a transition diet be have that in mind if you want to try and pick that up if you uh, if you can during the presentation yeah um that's something probably just we'll come on to a little bit later on Perfect. so yeah it will be covered thank you okay so at Buscat wick um sort of talking through with shane and with phil uh and looking particularly when we started looking back at the the heifer rearing webinar we got into the whole area of around carving and and what had gone on in the previous season sort of the the uh the sort of 2020 uh, carving season and the run up to that. Um, and, you know, essentially in common with many autumn carving herds, far off dry cows are grazing. Uh, as Shane mentioned, there's a lot of river meadows, quite nice, nice quality grazing, nice environment. And then close up TMR to um, the close up cows in a shed with self locking yokes. So this building is then used for, for, for breeding heifers later on. So it's sort of getting really good use of the shed. Um, but obviously, like many sheds, it, it, is, it is of a finite size. And as the carving block intensified and became more and more heavily front loaded, then uh, it was clear that there was significant pressure on feed space within this building. So milk fever was a real issue and transition performance, I think, was probably a bit variable. And on the back of the heifer rearing webinar, I identified that the early carved heifers um, had some pretty variable production numbers but also more worryingly had a very high cull risk and the only difference we could really see between the heifers that carved early in the block and heifers that carved say three four weeks later when overall numbers were way way lower um, was that it was down to the the sheer stocking density and intensity of number of animals in that close-up group so we'll show you some figures a bit later on but um it was quite worrying in terms of what was happening to the the sort of the golden heifers in effect the, the the first lactation animals carving at the beginning of the group they are the most sort of valued animals within that block carving system however um, they were in effect in my view being broken so the challenges included this below average uh, target feed space because of the very high carving rates in week one to three and also a flush of grass in the carving paddock, paddock following summer rain. And, and these two things really sort of interlinked in that I felt that because feed space was limiting, it was very easy uh, then for animals to just decide not to go and eat the TMR, which had got the minerals, et cetera, in, and just to go and wander around the paddock and pick at the grass because it was a lot easier than fighting their way uh, in to the two dead end passages uh, and into the oaks to to eat the TMR. So uh, the two things really went hand in hand and I think were a very big uh, risk factor in terms of milk fever and poor transition. So the aim this year is to sort of have some more targeted sort of mature standing hay type material to strip graze the far dry cows because I, I feel that it's very easy to over condition uh, the far dry cows on on even what's reasonable quality grass. So they've got nothing else to do all day. If they're grazing grass, which is 11 ME, you know, they will comfortably eat 11, 12 mega, uh, kilos of dry matter a day. So we're up at 110, 120, 130 megajoules a day, um, which is 
20 to 30 percent in excess of their requirement so the only thing they can do with that excess is store it as fat so coming back to the question earlier we're usually looking at an energy density through the early dry period of probably nine to nine and a half ideally and then maybe a little bit higher towards 10 or so uh, in in the close-up depending on on what feeds are available and, and and what intakes we're getting but with sort of nice meadow grazing uh, I feel that they can easily uh, consume excess energy so the aim now is to have a much more mature product a standing hay going to seed gone to seed uh, which will be strip grazed uh, in order to force them to eat the fiber as well as the leaf target then of four weeks in the close-up based on due date and this is another interesting one uh, again particularly with summer carvers uh, there are a number of things which can sort of bring carving forward a little bit um, so sex semen heifer calves for example will tend to carve a little bit earlier uh, if there's heat stress they will tend to carve a little bit earlier so it's important to to look at the due date and to give enough time in the close-up because i'm i'm certain that if we if we target four weeks if we then look back at the end of the season we will find that very few animals will have actually had a full four weeks and many will have probably only had three so um, there are lots of little things that can just bring carving forward uh, and therefore it's important to have enough time for them to settle into that group settle onto the the major diet change coming from outstanding hay into the tmr and and carving paddock uh, so you know that that's one way you can get caught out if you if you run a little bit tight on that sort of aiming for three weeks and it getting nearer two and then finding animals are actually carving four or five days before their due date. Uh, the other thing we're going to move towards for two reasons: uh, one, one is housing the heifers separately in another building. Uh, they would be in a heifer group post carving, so they will now be in a heifer group pre carving in the main. This will this will offer two benefits one they will remain as a heifer group but secondly it will free up a lot of additional space for the, the cows so again there's a big intensity of carving at the beginning of the block so the building that was previously the only building in use will be for cows only and the heifers will have a similar space allocation in another building so i'm really confident that that's going to make a significant showing a significant benefit uh, we carried out forage mineral analysis of the silages so that's something we'll come on to a bit later on uh, and like i say it really is about increasing this feed space to try and maintain target tmr intake pre-carving so going back to the heifer webinar what we found when we looked into the data uh, so august 2019 so the two weeks of august roughly 57 heifers carved plus a very large number of cows so there was a huge intensity of carving in that end of august period uh, those animals were 23 and a half months average age of carving uh, and they went on to do a 305 day milk yield of 6900 the heifers that carved in the month of september so in a four week period there were 28 so you know you've gone from 57 in two weeks to 28 in four weeks and the corresponding drop in cow numbers so really the whole pressure on space and and feed space etc had been gone by the september carvers in the main they were slightly older obviously by 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 definition so they were sort of two to three weeks older but those animals went on to give 7458 so there was a 500 plus liter yield benefit in the heifers that carved in september rather than august and having spoke to Phil and Shane, the only thing that we could really nail this on was what was happening around transition, because post calving, they were all treated exactly the same. They're on a full TMR, no parlor feeding. And, and if anything, it could be argued that the later calving heifers would have been turned out to grass sooner and therefore would have had less time on the TMR and less time on feed. So there was a pretty significant, you know, positive effect on milk yield there which i'm really certain is linked to transition and and space pressure even more worrying was the impact on culling so of those 57 august carving heifers 15 had disappeared by the following december so by that point we were of the view that all day they had not carved back in and were not in milk so 26 percent of those August calving heifers, the golden heifers, the ones that we really want to work with, had disappeared from the herd prior to the second lactation. 
the heifers that calved a month later, or two to three weeks later, two out of 28 disappeared, which was 3.6%. So we had a 23% reduction in risk of culling. Uh, we then looked back in previous years and the numbers were pretty consistent in that roughly 25% of the first lactation heifers were not milking into the second lactation. So I think, you know, this is certainly something for anybody that's running a tight autumn block to be aware of. Make sure that your heifers are not being broken because of the intensity of the calving and transition. So the lactation curves for the August, September heifers, the September heifers consistently produced more milk right the way from day one and maintained that through the winter. So this year, uh, again, we've got a similar pattern. So 18th to 31st of August, 73 cows, 49 heifers, a total of 122 calvings, an average of 10 per day through the second half of August. As we get on into September, first part of September, we're down to six a day, second half of September, six a day, and then October, the whole month, one to two today. So you can appreciate there the impact, not only on uh, staffing, but also feed space, lying space, calf management, transition cow management, fresh cows, etc. When you've got 10 a day calving every day uh, for that two week period, uh, you know, life will certainly be a lot more manageable when they get into, into phase two. So, you know, this is where we're at. The aim of the block is to have a nice tight block, but we do have to then take steps to, to manage that, that real surge in calving. So I'll defer to Phil and Shane now for a couple of minutes just to perhaps talk a little bit more about that and, and some of the issues and some of their thoughts before we go on to the final session. Thanks, Evan, and uh, thank you, Shane and Phil, for coming back on. Perfect. And yeah, views, I guess, uh, in a couple of minutes. What's your view so far? What, what do we need to think about? Is there any other questions it's thrown up from you? With regards to uh, uh, with regards to what you've heard so far, um, it all sounds yeah. Um, I'm I'm happy with how it sounds and the plan going forward. And yeah, a bit excited actually to get going and seeing the difference we're going to make from last year. Um, yeah, percentage improvements, heifer survivability in the herd. Um, yeah, and I I think the um it'll be because because it's the first year we've done the standing hay it'll just be we'll have to watch it because yeah just because we haven't really had to do it before but a neighbor of ours is it does does a similar system so we can we can sort of pile in with him and uh, keep an eye on what he does and um yeah yeah that's useful phil yeah i think that the it 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 looks like it's going to be a predictable repeatable simple system which is which is what we need we need to know that year in year out we're we're, we're going through a process which is is going to be consistently delivering delivering what um, what we need and then um and then we don't need to put quite so much effort into the setting up of it each time because we know that we, we just turn the handle and crank out what we did before but that's that's the whole point of trying to change try for different things and de develop it and then and but measure as we go so that we know for next year what we're what we're trying to create again yeah yeah that repeatability that familiarity with what you're trying to do uh, is is a big one isn't it yeah excellent right thank you guys and uh, we'll let having uh, press on we've got kind of uh, 10 10 minutes of real time uh, left and and we have asked the majority of the questions so far but uh, encourage people to uh, continue. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks, Evan. Okay. So risk factors, because uh, I think this is where we've really got to critically look at what's going on on an individual farm and identify where the real risk factors around these pinch points are. So I often use the analogy of of, of building blocks and. If we take each risk factor as being a building block, the logic being that the more we stack one on top of the other, the more unstable the tower becomes. And therefore, if we've got multiple risk factors on individual cows or groups of cows, we're more at risk of, of everything toppling over and ending up in a mess. So risk factors would include this excess body condition at dry off uh, and, and 
right the way through to calving. So again, managing body condition, managing lactation length, managing uh, energy intake in the far off dries will all have a positive impact on uh, on body condition score. Excessive energy in the far off dry period is a real risk and a real challenge with grazing far off dry cows. Hence the move to standing hay to produce a lower energy density, more fibrous product. Twin bearing cows are certainly a high risk in terms of transition. So if these are identified and marked and recorded coming through, uh, it's really worth throwing everything you can at these in terms of giving them the TLC that they need. So obviously their demand is significantly higher, but their feed intake will tend to be significantly lower. So if we know who they are, we can probably do things like bring them into the close up sooner uh, and, and also be very sort of proactive around calving in terms of additional supplements. If the dry or transition diet is not suitable, that's a real risk factor because we're predisposing the animal to uh, to, to, to problems, be it milk fever or otherwise. Uh, things like diet sourcing or below target and variable intake are real issues as well. So uh, straw based diets very often, uh, if the straw isn't well chopped, uh, are very, very prone to sourcing. So what we need to do there is to chop the straw better, um, but also we can add in uh, liquids, water being the obvious cheap, effective way of reducing that sorting. Um, molasses is not really an option because of the high potassium content. In certain parts of the country, distillery syrups, etc., can work very well, but water is probably the most universal uh, diet sorting uh, alleviator that we can use. So bringing the dry matter of that TMR down, if we're feeding a straw-based TMR, uh, will definitely reduce the risk of sorting. Um, if intakes for the group are below target, we then need to start to question why. Uh, is that down to space? Is it down to palatability? Is it down to uh, presentation of the diet, freshness, etc.? And if we're seeing variable rumen fills, then we need to look at those individual animals. So these are all risk factors that which may or may not be there. Badly timed group and diet changes, due date accuracy again coming into, into play here. When do they move on to that close group? When do they move on to the diet? You know, is that too close to calving? Is it too big a change, uh, too close to calving? Again, these are things that we need to question and look at. Overstocking limited feed space, uh, just we've already covered it, but it's a huge risk factor. And again, this high calving intensity, a stress system uh, is, is a real risk factor to those individual cows. And it's it's no different to, to sort of any, you know, as we saw, for example, with COVID in hospitals, uh, you know, when the numbers were relatively low, it's understandable that, that hospitals were a lot better able to cope with individual cases. When the hospitals were under incredible pressure, then unfortunately, I'm sure people fell by the wayside. So, you know, we've got a cow that is unfortunate enough to calve at the absolute peak. She is at far greater risk of transition issues than if she was calving three weeks later when the peak is over and there's more space, there's more time and everything's a little bit more relaxed. Heat stress, huge transition risk, as are any underlying health issues such as lameness, yonis, etc. So if we look at each one of those and imagine them that they're a building brick, we start to stack up an overconditioned cow, a poor dry cow transition diet, overstocked shed, and heat stress, we're immediately up to four risk factors, four risk uh, factors which can very quickly lead to that cow toppling over calving. So the recommendations that I've recommended at Buscut Wick for the coming season are to produce this mature standing hay for the far dry cows to control energy intake, increase the space allowance for the close-up TMR and run a separate heifer group, uh, carry out forage mineral tests on grass and maize silage, Use the yearling heifers to control grazing on the calving paddock as required. Use bespoke high specification mineral vitamin pack for close up cows, which would include some protected choline, uh, possibly methionine, and then possibly use a high calcium fresh cow drink for older or possibly all cows. So these are all discussion points we're going to be having in the coming weeks. So the forage minerals, uh, I took some samples the other week and these, these finally came through yesterday, uh, pretty much as expected. So we looked at maize silage from uh, 2020, first cut grass silage from this year, which is fairly mature, cut a little bit later than planned, I would suspect. Um, so, you know, on one hand, we'd think, well, it perhaps won't be quite as potent in terms of potash as it may have been. 
and then I also took some sort of grass samples from the carving paddock. So although we're not there yet, uh, these were sort of grass samples taken as I imagine cows would selectively graze. So they weren't taken from immediately around a dung pat, um, but they were probably the kind of uh, grass material that the cows would choose to graze if they were running in and out of the shed. So potassium being our big risk factor and probably 1% being our sort of safe level if we weren't feeding anything else. So if we would got 1% or so, we'd probably get away with milk fever uh, with, with one particular forage. So maize generally is low. Uh, this is particularly low. So we're down at about half a percent potassium in the maize. So from a, from a potassium, from a milk fever point of view, the maize does give us a very safe base forage to work with. The first cut was probably a little bit higher than I anticipated at two and a half. So, you know, significantly five times higher potash level in the first cut than the maize. And bear in mind, this is a mixed dairy and arable farm where, you know, muck and slurry is moving around the sort of the, the wider area, not just being concentrated on the forage production area. So you can imagine if you're on a pure dairy farm where you're importing feed and applying all the manure and slurry onto the forage production unit, uh, these potash levels in grass silage can very quickly creep up to three, three and a half, and I've even seen over four percent. So we can end up producing a very, very high potash product. The graze grass was over three, it was about 3.2. So again, reflecting what's going on in that calving paddock, obviously high stocking density around calving, uh, and, and no offtake. So, so year on year, uh, the likelihood is that that potash level in that grazing paddock will increase. Straw is something that we use to try and dilute potash down. Um, generally and historically, we would assume it would have a, a sort of potash content of about 1%. Some may be a little bit below that, but again, if it's grown within a sort of a rotation, where there is sort of fairly high potash indices on the farm as a result of uh, livestock and, and dairy cows particularly, it's quite feasible that straw can be one which will come and, uh, and catch you out because it will have perhaps nearer 2% potash rather than the sort of standard figure of about one. So straw will fall into this sort of below one to towards two category in most cases. Spring cereal straw will tend to be higher than winter cereal straw. Barley will tend to be higher than wheat. So they're all things to just bear in mind. If, if you're on a straw-based system on winter wheat straw, particularly from an all arable farm, then things might be going perfectly well. You move over to barley or you move to spring wheat or you know your own straw that you've produced on a small arable area, then it can catch you out because the potash level could quite possibly be double. The cation anion balance, which is the other thing that we're looking at in terms of potash, sodium, but also sulfur and, and chlorides. So the maize, very, very low. So with dry cows, we're looking to be, you know, down towards zero or, or, or even in a negative, depending on, on the feeding strategy. Um, milking cows, you know, 300, 350 plus. So the first cut, as you can see, is way out of line with where we want to be for dry cows, as is the grass. So that's our target zone at calving around there in the green. Uh, the maize gets us right into that zone. The grass and, the, and the, the grass silage are miles away. So, you know, we clearly have to do all we can to balance those out. Evan, just to uh, just to come in there for a second, uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is it looks like we are going to run just slightly over. We've got a couple of minutes left of real time. Uh, so apologies that it's uh, it's going to go five, uh, ten minutes over. Uh, for those who do have a hard deadline, then uh, remember this is being recorded. So the recording will be available in the next couple of days uh, for you to be able to pick up the last uh, five or ten minutes. Uh, there are some key points and, and summing up to do. So uh, apologies if you're going to miss those to start with, but hopefully you can catch up with the recording. And uh, I have got a question here which does fit with this uh, this area, so I will uh, will just uh, pitch that in with regards to um, how can farmers deal with fields with high P and K in uh, soil on calving paddocks? Uh, best field in front of the house for calving is high in P's and K's, which I know we've talked about before. Three pluses. Um, 
are there any measures that can be taken to reduce the incidence of milk fever? Um, I mean, the, the only way of reducing those would be to actually offtake. So uh, perhaps rather than grazing early in the season, perhaps shut them up for silage, take a cut of silage off, uh, and then obviously not apply any slurry or, or potash fertiliser. Um, if grazing animals obviously by definition just return uh, manure straight back to the soil that they're grazing on uh, so therefore the only way of reducing that going forward would be to 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 cut perhaps uh, you know an, an early cut of silage take it off that land uh, and then you know that would at least give you some offtake otherwise we're we're literally into trying to balance it out and trying to to manage intakes of of, of whatever we're using to to counteract it but again we've got the further challenge of of individual animals choosing one uh sort of feed over another which i'll touch on in a, in a minute that's very so thanks evan so this is Shane stood in the early stages of the standing hay this is probably getting on for three weeks ago now so i would assume that it's a long way further forward than that so that should really do a job on these far offs and then just phil stood in the carving paddock uh with the building in the background there where the cows run in and out so we're going to be incorporating straw um they've got a really good straw grinder on the farm so the straw is well chopped we want it to be uh really well chopped so that they're not sorting can add water in to, to minimize sorting as well and really we want all particles to be under about 50 mil so that they just eat what's in front of them rather than play around with it so on a practical level we looked at the building um this is the building self-locking yokes used for the heifers for breeding later on used to transition cows they run in at the far end of the building there uh, uh, and eat the, the sort of the transition tmr the layout of the building historically uh would have the bedded area completely closed off and the two feed passages accessed from the end nearest the field. Um, one weakness of this is that it gives two dead ends. Animals don't like dead ends and particularly uh, animals which are feeling a little bit tender and a little bit bullied will be very wary about being sort of penned up in a corner with a bully cow. So uh, if we can remove the dead ends, then we, we make it a lot more appealing and, and make it a lot safer for those animals to, to move around the shed to where they may be able to eat uh, and not feel that they're going to get trapped. So what I've suggested here is that we'll just gate across the bedded area and allow cows to flow from passage one through to passage two uh, and, and back out. So we'll create a circular uh, movement there if required rather than two dead ends. So the big issue and I think one of the big challenges uh, is TMR versus grass intake. So we've, we've formulated the TMR so we're looking here at a sort of combination of top straw, maize, a little bit of grass silage, some, some protein concentrate, minerals um, and, and magnesium chloride. Uh, so we're going to feed that at the feed barrier and then obviously they're going to run out to the paddock and they are going to consume some grass. So here, I think in an ideal world, we'd probably get about two kilos of dry matter of grass a day, taking the analysis of the grazing that we, we took the other day. So this gives us a total dry matter intake of about 12, 120 megajoules, which we can live with, decent level of protein, good level of magnesium, 76 grams of magnesium from the magnesium chloride and a decab of three which is getting very close to zero and i would say is in a pretty safe zone in terms of milk fever management so if we can achieve that across the board i think we're in a fairly fairly safe place however feed space is limiting uh feed access is an issue palatability of feed is an issue or they just think we'll go and graze more because it's quite nice and young and leafy and sweet and we get up to four kilos of dry matter of grass we will then have a lower consumption of the tmr so instead of the sort of 25 kilos we can be down to about 19. so we're still in the same sort of overall intake zone but probably going to eat a little bit less because that grass doesn't really hang, hang around for too long and it's easy to eat still got the energy intake got a bit more protein because the grass is high in protein magnesium supply has dropped so magnesium is important for milk milk fever management but the decab has now moved up dramatically from three, which is virtually zero, up to about 120. So just that little bit of a shift from the TMR to more grass, um, with the analysis of the grass that we've already taken, 
is now putting us into the milk fever danger zone. If we go another step and we end up with cows that choose or feel that they can't get enough TMR on board, so they fill up on six kilos of grass, which is roughly 50% of their intake, we're now looking at moving right up well into the milk fever zone, 242 decab, magnesium down at 47. And I suspect that this is what's been seen historically where feed space has been limiting, high intensity of carvings, animals close to calving have just gone for the easy option of not going in to compete to eat the TMR but go and fill up on more grass completely throwing the mineral balance out and going from a safe zone here to a higher risk zone here and a very high risk zone over there so that really is the challenge that we have uh, and that's what we've got to try and monitor as much as possible is that overall TMR intakes are on track if they're not we need to make a few very quick adjustments in terms of maintaining the mag and the mag chloride intake uh, because that will be indicative that they are taking more grass than we really want them to at that stage. So the milk fever risk is dramatically higher uh, when we get that sort of shift. So key messages, manage body condition, maintain that body condition through the dry period, do all you can to keep dry matter intake up through to calving. Room and fill and activity monitors can help you identify issues. Avoid overcrowding on beds and at the feed fence. Protect your heifers because they are so valuable, particularly in this block. Assess the forage base, formulate a suitable diet, and see the dry period as pre-season training and not a cow holiday. And above all, record transition metrics so that you can assess them later and then plan for next year. So it's very important to have a review at the end of the season, you know, get some good data, how many milk fevers, how many retained cleansings, how much botrytis, what went on, what was good, what wasn't as good, what can we do differently? Because with a block carving system, you have one shot at goal and all you can then do is to use that to improve things in the coming year. So thank you for your attention. I apologize for going slightly over on time, uh, but any questions, feel free and we'll do our best to answer them now. That is brilliant. That's not far off for the amount of information that you've uh, shared today. I think uh, I'll give you uh, I'll give you the five minutes, uh, five minutes over heaven. Thank you. And uh, I think there are a number of questions uh, recognizing that we're over. I think we could pick up probably one just quickly about robots, which came in earlier uh, around propylene glycol and uh, the feeding through robots. Uh, how much and for how long? Is that something that uh, you'd be able to uh, put some figures against? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something, uh, you know, propylene glycol and ketosis, you know, it's a sort of, it's the go-to fix it as it were and, and the general advice would be about sort of 250 300 mil for three days if drenched robots do obviously give the opportunity to feed uh automatically for longer uh if required so i think it's it's very much farm specific depending on yield and prevalence of problem um whether it's something you're going to do for all fresh cows or whether it's something you're going to target at cows that have been tested for ketosis but um that would be the sort of number uh, on a on a very sort of a targeted drenching program um you know a slightly lower level fed for slightly longer may be uh apt in a robot system but um it would be one to look at individually really Right. OK. And uh, finally, and uh, we, there is a couple more and we will answer them and we'll put them into the uh, onto the onto the pages on the website and uh, uh, come back to those those other questions. But uh, with regards to we were talking standing hay and the ideas of, uh, of looking at that standing hay as an option or for uh, planning this year, is there a wet weather plan? Uh, now Oxfordshire is not known for being particularly wet through July and August, but is there a wet weather plan and can it help other people uh, in other other parts of the country which may have to think about uh, the effect of, of wet on that uh, uh, on that standing hay? I, I think the short answer is <coughs> there is there isn't really a wet weather plan. <coughs> I mean, the assumption that the, the benefit of, of the standing hay is is the, the damage that we cause to the paddock. There's a high seed return going back in and that that will 
effectively become a, a, a reseed um, for next season. We've we've specifically chosen two fields, which which aren't great. They have gone past their best from a from milking grass production point of view. Um, so I I I would probably say the the risk of the standing hay is low. The only problem will be that when we're trying to strip graze them, if, if it is really wet and chucking it down, it's it's how we keep them. I'm not worried about the feeding, I'm worried about where they're lying um, and the, the condition of, of the ground that they're then led on and mastitis ahead of carving. Yeah, yeah I think in fairness, it, it's a fairly resilient system um, in that, yeah, I think if you had absolutely extreme biblical weather well i suppose the ultimate fallback would be they'd have to go into the cubicles but i think you know that would be absolute extreme in that it, you know it is long material it'll be strip grazed they will tend to sort of get tucked in uh, take a lot of food on board and then go and lie down so it's yeah i mean you never say never but i i would think particularly bearing in mind the location geographically um i would be fairly relaxed that there wouldn't need be need for a plan b in 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 many years out of 10. <laughs> yeah. yeah no that's brilliant right i a uh, couple of a uh, couple of shout outs i guess for the in calf guide hdb in calf guide we have um uh, which is also set for uh, uh it's published as a block uh, block carving publication and an all year round publication so that's one to uh, to go to the website and have a look for. Uh, we also have a uh, transition cow chart uh, that can help uh, just record uh, record issues and and try and identify uh, through that uh, through that period uh, what's uh, what's gone on. So two two publications there from HDB that might help. Uh, my uh, final piece is to just highlight we've got a couple of events, uh, physical farm events. Um, uh, finally uh, happening uh, one in uh, early July to uh, uh, 6th of July in Leicester uh, Garner and Wade Honeypot Farm and uh, go to the events web part of the website and or have a look at your Monday Monday email and the other one down in Sussex on the 13th of July is Nick Bell and talking about lameness and uh, redu reducing lameness and, and improving mobility so uh, two physical events that uh, we can currently take a maximum of 30 people at but uh, please register for those if you uh, are interested my thanks go to phil uh, for uh, uh, persevering with uh, with the, with the digital uh, delivery when wanting to get back out on farm and and the next one we definitely will do uh, thank you shane for your update and good luck with both of you for uh, uh, for the transition and into uh, into carving and my thanks to you, Kevin, for a very informative and, and in-depth uh, discussion. So uh, much you. appreciate it. We will suddenly disappear. There are more webinars coming. Uh, and so uh, I uh, look forward to uh, entertaining everyone again very soon. Thank you.